Hello everyone, welcome to this lesson. So we're going to talk about Lewis diagrams. So all it is, is it's a way for us to see how many electrons an atom has in its outer shell. So for example, in probably earlier grades, like grade 10, we would have looked at something like copper. Oh no, let's not use copper. Let's use something like carbon. Okay, now carbon. Now carbon is in row number two. So what that means is it would have had two rows. Now I know teachers don't teach it like that. So if you're a bit confused, that's fine. And because carbon has a periodic number of six, it means it has six electrons. In the first row, there are one, two, okay, so it had two electrons over there, and then three, four, five, six on the outside. So, and they were always separate like this. There we go. So that is what carbon looks like. We call that a Bohr diagram. But when we are looking at Lewis diagrams specifically, we are not interested in the inner shells. We are only interested in the most outer one. And so what's really nice is that if you just count the group number, so that's group number one, group number two, group number three, group number four, we will see that carbon has four electrons on the outside. And so let's say we want to draw a Lewis diagram of fluorine. So we know that fluorine is in group number one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So where the way it works is you draw separate electrons like that in four separate locations. Why four separate locations? It's got to do with the different orbitals surrounding atoms. Don't stress too much about it. Just remember that there must be four different places. And then once you've done those four, then if there are any leftover electrons, you can start pairing them up. So that'll be five, six, and seven. And so that is the Lewis diagram of fluorine. Next, we will do boron. So boron is in group one, two, three. So you just draw B for boron, and then you put three electrons, always separated. Remember, because there are only four different locations that are possible. So that is boron. Let's try sulfur next. So sulfur is over here. So sulfur is in group one, two, three, four, five, and six. So we go separate first, up until four, and then you can pair them up. And so that is what sulfur would look like over there. Next, we can do neon. Neon is over here. Now, neon is in group number three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Okay, so what that means is that you first do four separate ones, and then you can pair them up like that. And so have a look at that. Neon is completely surrounded with these pairs of electrons. Whereas with something like sulfur, which we did previously, there was some electrons that were unpaired, such as this one and this one. You don't need to worry too much about that. I'm just highlighting that for now. So now you know the basics of drawing a Lewis diagram for each atom. Now we're going to start using that to help us identify the way things bond. So for example, if I asked you to take carbon and hydrogen, we're going to bond those together, but they're going to bond in a specific way. So carbon, if we do its Lewis diagram, well, carbon is in group number two, three, four. So we do four electrons and hydrogen is in group one. So it's literally just going to have one electron. So how are we going to bond these two atoms together? Because the way it works is that these individual circles that we can see here, those are electrons and electrons like to be in pairs of two. I don't know if you can remember in grade 10, you would have looked at the Aufbau diagram, which typically did something like this. And inside there, we used to have electrons. But the significant thing is, is that those electrons were always in pairs of two. They, I mean, if possible, sometimes there wasn't enough electrons and then they would be single. But if possible, they will bond in pairs of two. So pause the video and think if you can bond these two atoms together in the best possible way where all the lone pairs or the single electrons can bond together. Now I know that some of you at home are struggling with that. Many of my students in class, they do struggle with that at first because I've got, I'm not asking the question with a lot of detail. So the way it would work is this. Let's imagine that this hydrogen moves over and it bonds over there. Well, then you're going to end up with the following. 
But now this isn't the best scenario. We can do better than this, guys. What if we could take this hydrogen and, or what if we could make a couple of those hydrogens? So have a look here. We've just automatically produced three different hydrogens. And now each of those hydrogens can go bond with a different electron. And so we end up with the following. And so there we have it. These electron pairs are now very happy because they're all in a pair of two. Carbon is very happy because if you look at carbon, it's surrounded by two, four, six, eight. Now that number eight is going to be a very significant number going into the next couple of lessons. It's called the octet rule. Atoms like to be surrounded by eight things, but of course, as with everything, there are always going to be exceptions. For example, hydrogen only likes to be surrounded by two things. And so have a look here. This hydrogen surrounded by two. This hydrogen is surrounded by two. This hydrogen is surrounded by two. And this hydrogen is surrounded by two. And so the best possible way for carbon and hydrogen to bond is one carbon and four hydrogens. And so this would be called CH4. Okay, but in the next lesson, I'm going to spend more time on looking at the way that different atoms will bond together, such as water, which is H2O, ammonia, which is NH3, carbon dioxide. There's going to be a whole lot of common ones that, I've no, that I know get asked in exams. So I'll see you in the next lesson.